Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, FOIA Request for CDC COVID-19 Records. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participants and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note all audio connections are muted at this time. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the presentation, which will be addressed at the Q&A session of the webinar. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the webinar over to Alina Simo, Director of the Office of Government Information Services at the National Archives. Alina, please go ahead. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, good morning, everyone. As the Director of the Office of Government Information Services, OGIS, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this event titled FOIA Requests for CDC COVID-19 records. I hope everyone who is joining us today has been staying safe, healthy, and well. Shortly, I will go through some basic housekeeping rules, review our general agenda, and set some expectations for today's meeting. First, I would like to give you some background on today's event and how OGIS became involved. As many of you know, OGIS is the Federal FOIA Ombudsman. In that role, we work to improve the FOIA process in a number of ways, by reviewing agency compliance, by offering dispute resolution services to assist requesters and agencies, by chairing and managing bodies like the FOIA Advisory Committee and the Chief FOIA Officers Council, and more. In that role, OGIS has a unique perspective on FOIA programs across the federal government. We have been watching with interest the impact of the COVID-19 emergency on both how agencies are processing FOIA requests and the types of requests agencies are receiving now that work from home and stay at home have become the rule rather than the exception. Many agency FOIA programs are doing their best uh, to adjust their operations in response to the impact of COVID-19. We have heard success stories of FOIA programs at certain agencies that have managed to make a relatively seamless transition from full-time in-office work to 100% or close to 100% telework. And we have also heard of challenges that other agency FOIA programs face, including examples of how remote work has resulted in delays and other process disruptions across the government. While many agencies have been in a reactive mode, we are very excited to hear from the CDC's FOIA program about their plans to be proactive and reach out to their stakeholders and requesters. And that is how the idea for this webinar that OGIS is co-hosting today was born. So that is the purpose of today's event, to hear from the CDC about how they are working to make COVID-19 records available and what they need from the requester community to make the agency requester partnership as successful as possible. With regard to today's agenda, we will hear from Roger Ando, CDC's FOIA Director and FOIA Officer. In conjunction with Roger's presentation today, we direct you to the PowerPoint that we will run during the webinar today, and that is also accessible on the OGIS website, archives.gov forward slash OGIS. Roger will then be joined by Bruno Diana, the current CDC Acting FOIA Officer, as we turn to focus to your questions. We will be taking questions throughout the presentation, so as you think of your questions, please type them using the chat function of the webinar. We will also open the telephone lines after Roger's presentation for those of you who would like to ask general questions. We will do our best to answer as many questions we receive today via chat and telephone. If we are unable to get to your question, we will follow up with questions and answers that we will post on our website after today's webinar event. An important reminder with regard to your questions. Please be aware that this is not the right forum to ask questions about specific FOIA requests. However, if you have a general question about the CDC's FOIA process or records, we are glad to hear those. We are also recording today's session and will post a video of this event on the OGIS website as soon as it becomes available. 
At this time, I would like to take a minute to introduce our main presenter today, Roger Ando. Roger joined the CDC on June 27, 2016 as the FOIA Director and FOIA Officer. Roger transferred from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, where he served as the agency's FOIA Officer. Roger has extensive experience supervising units responsible for handling high-profile and highly sensitive FOIA requests. In 2014, Roger was awarded the Greater Kansas City Federal Executive Board Federal Employee Distinguished Leadership Award for his work in processing multiple FOIA requests for information surrounding the Boston Marathon bombing and his benchmark work in handling highly sensitive information involving designated terrorist groups as a supervisory government information specialist with the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Roger is a licensed attorney and a certified privacy professional. Although Bruno will not be presenting, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce him as he promises to be an active participant during the Q&A session that follows. Bruno Viana currently serves as the acting CDC FOIA officer and has been the CDC deputy FOIA officer since 2011. Bruno's entire federal career has been as part of the CDC FOIA office, which he joined in 2004. At this point, I will turn the program over to CDC FOIA Officer Roger Ando. Roger, over to you. Thank you, Alina. Good morning, everyone. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at the Department of Health and Human Services are heavily engaged in dealing with COVID-19. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's not surprising that both CDC and HHS have seen a steep increase in COVID-19 FOIA request. The CDC FOIA Office is adapting to this unexpected flood of FOIA request, and we are eager to respond to requests as quickly as we can. We view the relationship between the agency and the requester community, especially journalists, as a partnership. Good communication with requesters is key to any successful FOIA operation. So we reached out to OGIS to assist us in facilitating this call today. The goal is how best you can help us help you. That's the goal, how best you can help us help you. In my presentation today, I will cover three main topics. One, CDC's FOIA process. Two, how CDC is responding to COVID-19 requests. And finally, share some tips with you on how to submit a successful FOIA request. But before I do so, let me please share a little bit about the mission of CDC and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, ATDSDR. Next slide, please. So the CDC and ATSDR are both agencies of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. However, CDC carries out administrative functions for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. So the CDC director also acts as the administrator for ATSDR, just something for I want to know. CDC is the nation's health protection agency. We work 24-7, we, we conduct critical science, we provide health information that protects the public against, <coughs> excuse me, against dangerous health threats and respond to threats when they're okay, like we are responding right now to the um, coronavirus pandemic. CDC promotes quality of life and works to prevent the leading causes of disease, injury, disability, and death. We have more than 12,000 employees. 75% of, of, of CDC employees are located in Atlanta, Georgia. We have 2,000 employees who are stationed in 60 countries around the world. And um, the types of documents that CDC typically generates are varied. Um, I would say that if you want to submit a FOIA request to CDC and to any agency, the first place you should start with is go to their website. That would give you a sense of what it is that they're doing. Go to your website. Secondly, take a look at their FOIA log. Their FOIA log would give you, would give you the roadmap to the types of documents that any agency tends to create. And CDC posts, we post that FOIA log on our website, and so that would be a good place to start if you want to know the types of documents that we, um, that the agency creates. But I'll just give you a few examples today. 
CDC is involved in outbreak investigations, so obviously this coronavirus is one of them. Um, others that we've been involved in have been included the salmonella outbreaks, Legionnaire's disease, E. coli, the Ebola outbreak, measles. CDC has labs, so you can make a request for lab safety records. CDC has oversight, oversight in labs, uh, for example, select aging labs. Um, CDC issues guidelines, uh, for example, on opioids, sexually transmitted diseases, vaccines, immunizations, um, just to name a few. And finally, I want to make sure I'm covering everything. And finally, we, you can also request data and statistics from CDC. So CDC um, works with local and state authorities and obtains a tremendous amount of data that we analyze and do research on their behalf. And um, some of the requests that we see might around, some, we might involve influenza, uh, mortality rates, opioids, gun violence, lung injury associated with vaping and e-cigarettes to name a few. Next slide, please. So the Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry, what do they do? They protect the people's health from environmental hazards that are present in the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the world that sustains us. And how do they do this? By investigating the relationship between environmental factors and health, by developing guidance, and by building partnerships to support healthy decision-making. And like I said earlier, I'm going to restate, ATSDR is an independent operating division within the Department of HHS. However, CDC carries out its administrative functions. One of those functions includes handling their FOIA request. So what types of documents could you get from ATSDR? Documents related to our climate and health program, Food safety, air safety, safe water. We're involved in the, water, in the Flint water crisis and the Count Lejeune water crisis. Um, ATSDR also is involved in cruise ship inspection. That might be of interest to some. And they also create health reports. Um, for example, they study the human exposure to environmental contaminants. Next slide, please. This is the current CDC organizational structure. So the purpose of this chart would be, would, you could use this as a reference point for custodians of records when it comes to specifically COVID-19 requests. Now, that does not mean that you want to target everybody on this list and say, I want all their records, because not, every, not all of them are involved in the response and not all of them are involved in every aspect of the response. So you have to be very targeted as to what individual's records you're seeking. Now, if you, if you haven't noticed, but I'll point it out to you, they, some of them have asterisks besides their name. Those individuals are in acting positions, so they're not permanent, so they, they could change. Um, the person hi highlighted in yellow, Ms. Sherry Berger, um, she's highlighted because the FOIA office is now part of her office. We used to be part of the, we used to report to the chief information officer. The chief information officer reports to the chief operating officer. And sometime I think in 2017, we were reorganized and moved directly to report to her. And that I think shows um, the support that the agency has for the FOIA program and how important they know it is. And she's, very, she's been very supportive of the FOIA program and I have to, put that plug in for her. Next slide, please. So this is just, uh, this shows you the slide, uh, the Office of Director for um, ATSDR. Uh, as you can see that it has a Deputy Director, so it's still Philip, and if you look at the previous slide, she reports to the Director for CDC. So, um, and as I said, earlier, and just to reiterate, the director of CDC is the administrator of ATSDR. Just a, a quick note, 
the vast majority, or probably all the, the COVID-19 records that we received have, have been for CDC records. So this is just a takeaway for you in case at some point you want to make a non-COVID-related request uh, for ATSDR records. This would be a good guide for you. Next slide, please. And this is just a, an illustration of the, the divisions within um, the program. Next slide, please. Now, this is an organizational chart for the Office of the Chief Operating Officer. As I, as I indicated, the Freedom the FOIA Office reports directly to her. Um, previously, we reported to the Office of Chief Information Officer, as you can see from the, from the chart, the Chief Information Officer reports to the Office of the Director. Next slide, please. The CDC FOIA Office. The CDC FOIA Office handles all FOIA requests for the entire agency, period. And we also handle requests for ATSDR. What we do is when a FOIA request comes in, unless we, we do our best to identify what programs within the agency would have responsive records. And most times we used our institutional knowledge of the FOIA request. Um, you have someone like Bruno who's been there for a very long time, so he's very familiar with some of the records that the programs generate. And sometimes the requesters would give us enough information to direct us to where to go. And we do this electronically. So we, 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 we send through our automated tracking system what we call a request for documents to a program or multiple programs, and we, send, we attach a copy of the FOIA request, and we basically don't tell them how to do, conduct the search. The, the requester directs how the search is going to be conducted. Now, if the program has concerns or needs clarification with a request, they can reach back out to us to help them out. Now, sometimes we facilitate direct communications with a requester, and sometimes it's been helpful in helping their programs get what the requester needs. Or sometimes we've, the, requester, the program would say, look, we can help you outside of the FOIA process. Can we just do that? And they say, sure. And then the request is closed, and they assist it outside the FOIA program. Each, each CDC has centers, institutes, and offices. So for short, if I, if I refer to CIOs, that's what I mean. We also have business service offices, BSOs. The BSOs are the, the offices that are more in the, support, in the support role. So they support the CIOs. So it, the human resources organization, for example, is a BSO because it supports the programs. Each CIO and BSO has a FOIA coordinator embedded within the organization. They are the ones who are the liaison between the programs and the CDC office. So we submit our FOIA request to the FOIA coordinator or coordinateness, and then they triage the request within their programs or centers, however they deem fit. So we don't direct them as to how to do it. They, they do all that. We give them a set amount of time to respond to a FOIA request, to, 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 to give us records. If they ask for extension, we tell them we don't give extensions. You just be late. And we have an overdue list that we track that we report up to our leadership when we have outstanding FOIA requests from the programs. It's a way of making sure that people take FOIA seriously. Now, once the FOIA office receives documents, then our job is to review the documents. Now, let me probably pause and step back. So people have a sense of what actually it takes, right? So the four records come in, and they might come in as emails, PDFs, a spreadsheet, name it. Once those documents come in, those documents need to be now be uploaded into our processing system. So depending upon the volume, it might take a few minutes, or it could take hours to upload into the assigned request that, that needs to be processed. Once those documents are uploaded into the system, then the foreign analyst needs to start going through those documents to locate responsive records. Sometimes 
the set of records that are, are given to us are very targeted, and there's very there are very few documents that are what we refer to as out of the scope of the request. So the more documents are within the scope of the request, the faster it is to process. The more documents that we have to review that are outside the scope of the request, the more time it takes to go through to process a FOIA request. Once an analyst completes processing the request, typically it has to go to through a second layer of review. So we make sure that we that we are not making any improper releases. Sometimes it could be a third or fourth review. What I have done with the programs to make sure that they are comfortable giving us records, that's one of their, their concerns when I first came to CDC, was that they didn't like to give records to the FOIA office because um, sometimes they got blindsided by what was released and they were upset with some of the stuff that got out, weren't very happy, and so I guess their knee re reaction was, well, we'd rather not give it to you because we give it to you, it's just going to go out. So what I did was, look, if you guys have concerns about the records that we are releasing, Sometimes we don't know how sensitive it might be. It might, be. it might not be obvious to us. Let us know, okay? Let us know. And I would I give the subject matter experts the opportunity, in some cases, not all cases, because I say, look, we can't do that for every case. In some cases, the opportunity to take a look at what we're going to release so they are, they are comfortable and go, okay, yeah, we have no concerns. And sometimes when they say, look, we want you to redact A, Y, or Z, and I don't agree with them, I say, I'm not going to do it. We can't do it. It's not defensible, right? Because ultimately, under HHS regulations, the FOIA officer for every each operating division makes the final determination of what can and cannot be released under the FOIA. So at the end of the day, the buck stops with whoever the FOIA officer is, and they know that. And I make sure they understand that. All you do is to recommend. You don't dictate what goes out and what doesn't go out. Next slide, please. So this is an illustration of the typical life cycle of a FOIA request. So once we receive the request, we acknowledge it within 48 hours. Um, let me explain acknowledgement here for, for, for a brief second. Right now, most of our FOIA requests are, are, being, are, are inputted by the FOIA requests themselves through our public access link, which is the public facing um, portion of our FOIA Express tracking system. Or when folks go to the National FOIA portal, which is the DOJ.gov um, site, and they submit a FOIA request to CDC, it automatically enters our processing system. We just did that this year. We made sure that we're integrated with the portal so that once you submit a FOIA request to CDC from that site, it automatically enters our system. And in both instances, you're supposed to get an acknowledgement that you your request has been received, which is a good thing. But you will see a formal acknowledgement letter. Our goal is to send it to you in 48 hours. Our regulation says we can send it to you in up to 10 days, but we try to, to do better. So we want to send it to you within 48 hours. In the acknowledgement letter, we're going to tell you a couple of things. What track that you're in. We will tell you, uh, we'll make an education on whether you, if you made a, FOIA, a request for expedited processing, if you made a request for a fee waiver, um, all those terminations, you'll be notified at that point. We'll tell you what your request number is. We will tell you um, whether you, what your fee category is and whether you could be charged fees. And if, fee, if so, what types of fees you could be charged. We also will tell you what is the estimated date of completion, which is just an estimate. I get calls a lot from folks going, hey, I got this request. I'm in a complex queue. It says six months down the road, I'm concerned about it. And I say, look, it is just an estimate, right? And we base that based on the level of work, how much time that we think it's going to take us to respond to a request. It is not our drop dead date. We don't say just because we said six months out, it means we're going to slow walk a request and, and respond to you in six months. No, our goal, my goal, Bruno's goal, all of us, we want to get requests out as quickly as we can. And I can't say this enough. We have no desire to hold on to FOIA requests, none. We want to respond to FOIA requests as soon as we can. And that's why we need your help to do that, because we both have the same goal, right? Now, when your request is acknowledged, 
sometimes we may ask, come back to you and say, we need you to clarify or narrow the scope of your request. And so that, and that can happen at any point in time. And once we've, you know, agreed on a clarified request or a narrowed scope of the request and discussed fees, then the next stage would be we send it to their programs to um, search for responsive records. Then the, the programs, like I said earlier, they, they collect the documents. They not only send us the documents, but they also have to document how the search was conducted, who conducted the search, where they looked, those kind of things, because we want to be able to be able to go back and go, okay, when we get challenged on the adequacy of the search, that we don't have to rely on people's memories for how a search was conducted. That's also the opportunity for them to tell, highlight for us if they have any concerns with the result of information that they're providing to us. Maybe it might contain confidential business information. It might contain PII. That's the opportunity to tell us, or it contains pre-decisional legal documents, attending client privilege. That's the opportunity to flag and say, hey, we have concerns with some information. That's the opportunity for them to say, no concerns. We have no concerns with this information. You can let it go. I'm do that. And so, uh, and then we process the document and the risk request closed. So that is a general life cycle. Um, I, I went and looked at where statistics in FY19. Sorry, more than 95 percent of our searches were conducted by the programs, and I want you to remember this because this is we're going to talk about when we talk about the impact of of, of COVID-19 on searches. You would understand. 95 percent, more than 95 percent of the searches were not conducted by the FOIA office. They were conducted by the programs. Next slide. When you take a look at any federal agency's FOIA personnel, it could be deceptive. It might seem that they have a lot more staff working on FOIAs than they really do. Um, because basically anybody who works in a FOIA office is tagged as FOIA personnel, when not everybody actually works on processing for a request. So the same is true for CDC. As you can see from this chart, um, FOIA personnel for CDC, let's look at the blue column, has stayed pretty stagnant. Um, when I joined CDC in 2016, I believe we had eight FOIA analysts. Uh, CDC had contractors because uh, they had a huge backlog. So we had support contractors to help us um, with our backlog. And um, sometime in 2000, when I came in 2017, as a result of some of the changes that we made, we were able to basically terminate the contract early because we no longer needed them. Because the FOIA analysts, we were caught up in the FOIA analysts. Basically, we didn't have enough work for the contractors because the contractors were paid based upon production, page count. So if there are no pages for them to process, they're not making money. So at some point it was like, we, we don't have case to give you because if we give it to you, then the RFPs will be doing nothing. So we might as well just let you guys go. So we saved the agency close to a million dollars just by doing that. Um, the FOIA staff, and then we lost, well, one member of the staff left to go to EPA. And so right now we are having around 16. So right now we are currently 16 FTEs. That includes Bruno and myself. So now we're down to 14, okay? Of these 14 that we have, we have one IT person, okay? So he does the IT searches. We have two appeal staff who handle uh, FOIA appeals. So they don't process initial FOIA requests. They only handle appeals. We have one communication person. So now we're down to 10 people who actually process the request, okay? Of these 10, only seven of them do it full-time. That's, they, they do it full-time. And the way we handle a FOIA request is that it's from cradle to grave. A request is assigned to an analyst and they keep that case until it closes, generally speaking. So you, and so in, in any communication that you'd have with them, even though the letters would be signed, would be signed with my name, you're actually dealing with an analyst who sent it to you. So whoever is calling you, or you email, and that's the person who is assigned to your request, and they they take your case from the from the from when it once it's assigned to them, up until the request is closed. So right now we have seven of them, and 
we're losing one um, very soon because she's moving on to a different, um, to pursue a different career, so we're going to be down to six. Now, we have three, we refer to them as work stream leaders. They help us in a support role. Um, they, they, they manage their FOIA service request line. Um, for those of you who want, the number is 770-488-6399. I'll say it again. The FOIA request service line is 770-488-6399. We answer the phone anytime. So if you have questions related to a FOIA request, you can call that number. Um, although preferably, I would prefer that you deal directly with the analyst handling your case. That way things don't get lost in translation. Um, they also um, manage our FOIA mailbox. We have a FOIA mailbox. It's a FOIA request at cdc.gov. So they also manage the, uh, the mailbox. So every day, um, emails are coming in, and they have to triage the, these emails, right? And so and they also have to review cases. Um, they do second line reviews, and they also assign cases, so they have to process cases. So there's a lot going on that they have to do. So in a nutshell, the number of folks who are actually processing for a request for the entire agency, including ATSDR, is 10, with one IT person helping to conduct searches. We used to have a contractor, um, but we lost the contractor. We are in the process of trying to recruit for an, another IT person just to help us with the volume of work that we have to deal with. We also have... Um, We've been approved for FTEs, for additional staff. Uh, one of the challenges that at least I've had since I've been at CDC is because we are based on Atlanta, and uh, typically um, government information specialist positions are not very highly graded, um, it's difficult to get people to move to Atlanta um, to accept positions. So we tend to get um, applicants who are not ideal. And my view is I would rather have it vacant than have somebody that I know can do the job. That's better. Um, but right now we are actually are now recruiting, um, and, and Bruno is actually reviewing some applicants, and we are hopeful that in the next, you know, couple of months would have an increase in it. But that is we are recruiting for a few staff, so it's not, it's not counting against our FOIA requesters. Um, but we've also been approved for two-term positions to help us with the COVID-19 request. So at some point, we're going to try and recruit for just two, um, 12, uh, two positions to help us strictly for COVID-19, and it's a 10 position, so at some point, they're not going to be permanent. At some point, they're going to leave the federal government, unless we convert them at some point. Next slide. So this is a chart of the CDC4 office, and, and you look for requests received, processed, and pending. And I want you to first look at um, the number of requests pending at the start of each fiscal year. So in 2015, CDC had pending 685. That translates to 685 requests that had been carried over from the year before, right? And so in 2015, they received 1,020 requests, so the total number of requests at some point would be 685 plus 1020. That's how backlogs happen when you have too many requests pending at the end of the fiscal year. And if you've seen the progression, by 2019, our pending was now down to 130. So when I say the CDC that we our interest is in responding to FOIA requests. I'm not just saying that. I mean that. And our data shows that that is what we are committed to doing. And we've demonstrated that consistently. So if you look at in 2016, which was when we had the highest number of pending FOIA requests, 749. That's a lot of work. And what did we do that year? We closed out a uh, 1,004. 445 requests, that's a lot of work is what we did, right? And so, and, and by the end of 2019, we had reduced, like I said, the number of requests pending to a very low number. And that is our goal. That's what we want to do moving forward. That's what we want to do with COVID-19. That's what we want to do, period, <laughs> whatever the situation is. Next slide.
for a request, response time for all process perfected request. Now, um, as we, we, we track how much time it takes us to respond to a FOIA request. And so let me first talk about simple requests and the complex request. So CDC has only two tracks. Some agencies have a simple track, complex track, accelerated track. CDC, we only have two. The track that we place your request in is based on the estimated amount of time and work it's going to take us to respond to your FOIA request. So if you want a FOIA request, your FOIA request to respond to you timely, you want to get it into the simple track. That's where you want to be, right? Because that means we, we estimate that it's going to take us a very short amount of time to close out your request. Now, if you could see, it's that by 2018, we were on average spending, taking only 54.88 days to respond to a complex FOIA request and 12.25 days to respond to a simple request. The 2019 data, uh, and Alina pointed out this out to me, and I had to go back and look at our data. Unfortunately, somebody made a keen error. So um, the number that is showing that we, it took us 122.6 days to, to respond to a simple request is actually not accurate. It's actually 12.6 days, um, but it is what it is. Um, but at least we know that that was a, a mistake, and that same number is reflected in panel of justice. So. Uh, report the data for non reports, but it's okay. Um, our complex, as you guys could see, our complex um, cases were responded to on average within 20.26.23 days. This goes to show you what CDC, um, how committed we are to responding to FOIA requests timely. Next slide. This chart tells you the types of exemptions that we apply. And what is an exemption? Exemption under the FOIA statute is a basis for, for, for which an agency could use to withhold information from release. There are nine exemptions. CDC primarily uses only a couple of them. Exemption three, four, five, and six. The exemption that we, we apply the most is exemption six. And then exemption five, and then exemption four, and to a, 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 and to a very small extent, exemption, exemption three. Next slide, please. So, exemptions, and what is the exemption three statute? The exemption three statute is basically that see, the agency is relying on another act passed by Congress that lays out the circumstances under which information may or may not be, uh, circumstances under which information may be withheld from release. So we're relying on another statute, not the FOIA statute, to withhold information. So the very first one, the Ethics in Government Act of 1978, that is used to protect confidential financial disclosure information. Some CDC employees, for example, the CDC director, are supposed to complete um, what they refer to as a Form 458. And that information is going to contain confidential financial information of, of these individuals, and this information would, is protected from, with, from our release. We want to talk about um, 242MD, Identify Information for Certain Research and Statistical Activities. CDC collects not, let me rephrase, not collects. CDC receives quite a bit of data from local and state authorities asking for CDC to conduct research or statistical analysis. Sometimes the research that CDC is conducting requires that we um, agree that the participants' information will be kept confidential. <clears throat> and so for those types of research, there is in place at the beginning of the process an assurance of confidentiality, AOCs. If an AOC applies to a data set that you're requesting for, then in more likelihood, there's some types of information that you're requesting that we cannot release because of the statute. 
With regard to the stockpile, um, CDC no longer applies this exemption because the stockpile has now been removed from CDC no longer. Uh, the, the, the employees of the, the Strategic National Stockpile are now um, part of the Office of the Assistant, Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, ASPAR. So it's now directly under Health and Human Services. So any request for stockpile information will be referred to HHS. And the last one, 262AH, bioterrorism-related information. CDC has select agent labs. CDC has oversight over select agent labs. And some types of information that are collected, that are contained within the records from these select agent labs can be withheld from release. Next slide, please. Expedited, expedited processing. That probably is of interest to a lot of people. In order to qualify for expedited processing, it is driven really the, our decision to, to grant or deny an expedited processing or AP is driven by the FOIA statute and, and by HHS FOIA regulations. So, and CDC, there are only two that CDC applies. I know some agencies have other provisions for when they can grant expedited process, but CDC only has two. So one is that the requester, you would have to articulate that if we don't provide you with these documents, that somebody or an individual would be, um, life would be in danger, basically, that somebody's life or safety would be uh, in danger. Secondly, another way that you can make a case for why we should grant expedited processing is that there's an agency to inform the public about an, a government activity, an alleged or actual government activity. And typically, it has to be done by somebody who's primarily in the business of disseminating information, aka it's easier for a news media person or a journalist or a group that disseminates information a lot to make the case that they qualify under um, the regulations for expedited processing. In 2019, we barely approved any expedited processing um, primarily because most not, the requesters were not able to make the case for why we should be, they should be granted expedited processing. But in every single case, we provide to, to, to request an appeal right so they could have appealed it. And I want you to, and if you go back and look at our data, it goes to show that even in spite of the fact that we did not grant expedited processing, we responded to FOIA requests pretty timely, and, and I didn't say this, but I'll say this now. Our complex queue, which is the queue you probably don't want to be in, the majority of the cases that we closed in FY19, we closed most of most complex requests were closed within 60 days, which is pretty pretty good for any agents to do. So, in spite of the fact that we didn't grant expedited processing, did have pretty good job at making sure that requesters get response to the request timely. What does an expedited process mean? All it means is that you get to jump the line. That's what it means. It means that we get to process your request outside of the normal process of processing FOIA requests. It doesn't, the statute does not lay out a, a, a specific amount of time that it should take to respond to an expedited pricing request. You're supposed to respond to it as soon as possible. When the CDC office receives a FOIA request and we are conducting a search for records and we ask for records from the programs, we do not put expedited requests at the front of the queue. We basically tell them you're supposed to respond for all requests X amount of time if you're late you're late, we don't give an extension, so we don't discriminate. But what we do is once we get um, a request for expedited processing has been granted, we process those requests ahead of 
requests that have not been granted expedited processing. However, if multiple requests have been granted expedited processing, then you are within an expedited processing queue. So even though we technically don't have one, our tracking system tracks requests for expedited processing that have been granted, and it, it, it puts them in order of when it was approved. So there's an, there's an order to that. In 2019, the, our average response time for expedited processing was 35 days. Unfortunately, we can't do that. I don't, I'm not, I don't think that we can meet that metric now. But the goal is that hopefully, if we can get um, FOIA requesters to work with us and make their request more targeted and more specific, we'll be able to do that. Next slide, please. Request for fee waivers. What is, again, fee waivers are driven by the FOIA statute and ATS regulations. You would ask for a fee waiver because you're saying, based on my fee category, a fee could be imposed on me, and I'm asking that for particular reasons that I have to articulate that I should be granted a fee waiver. Not, I don't say oftentimes, but sometimes we do see requests for fee waivers where they go, well, um, I'm a nonprofit organization. Therefore, give me a fee waiver. Or, I don't have money. Give me a fee waiver. A fee waiver is granted, that they are, you would have to refer to it as regulations, but just briefly. You have to show that the records that you're requesting, there's, that there's a public interest in it. And two, that you are requesting these documents not primarily in your commercial interest. But in order to make sure that your fee waiver is granted, your best bet is to take a look at the HHS FOIA regulations or so the regulations for the agencies whose records that you're requesting and make sure you articulate in great detail why you are entitled to a fee waiver for that request. A fee waiver is not carte blanche that we say, this organization or this person is entitled to a fee waiver for all your requests. No, your fee waiver is tied to a particular request that you're making. A request for expedited processing is, request, is tied to the particular request that you're making, not for all requests. So something for you to keep in mind. I know most of you do, but just something to keep in mind. Now, we adjudicate few of the determinations fairly quickly. And in 2019, and, and we didn't, would you see on the chart that um, quite a few were denied, right? Now, you might go, does it mean that we charge fees? No. So even though we denied quite a bit of fee waivers, we didn't end up necessarily charging fees. In fact, CDC and FY19 only collected in fees $30,000. So I did the math. We closed out 1,263 requests. That comes up to $25 for each request. That's it. Next slide. Number of incoming requests and complete for responses. So as you can see, um, in FY20, and this data right now is um, not is uh, is now outdated. Um, I checked yesterday, and we had reached 1,700 plus requests. That is more requests than we received for the entire fiscal year of 19 more than received in 18, more than we received in 17, 16, 15. Um, Same more requests than I've received. I don't know whether Bruno can speak to this, but we are probably on track to maybe hitting 2,000, maybe more than that, um, at the end of the fiscal year. Next slide, please. 
So let's start. I just want you to concentrate and focus your attention on the number of CDC personnel supporting the outbreak. Remember I said earlier that in 2019, over 95% of the searches that were conducted were conducted by the programs, aka by the custodians of the records themselves. With the COVID-19, and we have 4,600 CDC personnel, probably more than a quarter of CDC staff supporting the response, that has impacted our ability to collect records from the programs directly. Next slide. So here I just want to talk about the impact of COVID-19 specifically. So as it's obvious, you can see from the two slides prior, the FOIA office has received a significant number of COVID-19 related requests. I believe um, we're probably approaching 500 requests. Bruno, if I'm wrong, correct me at some point. Um, so we've experienced a 100% increase in income requests over the same period last year. Thousands of our CDC staff have been activated to assist with this pandemic, and, and that has impacted our ability to obtain records directly from the programs. So um, let me show this data here. Our FOIA analysts have seen, are now currently having a 500% increase in their workload. I want that sink in, right? They averaged 15 to 20 three months ago after all the hard work they did um, to bring a FOIA bar clock to its lowest point in recorded history for CDC. FY19, our FOIA bar clock was 18 to now they are carrying a workload of 80. Very soon they might be pushing 100 every single day, give or take. Because as you close, you get assigned new cases. And that's a lot of things that they have to juggle. But nevertheless, in spite of all that, we are committed every day to locating records and responding timely to all FOIA requests, including the COVID-19 FOIA requests. Um, we, this year, uh, next slide, please, next slide. So I've, I've talked about, now, the vast majority of COVID-19 FOIA requests have been approved for expedited processing. The last time I checked, I think it was yesterday, we've approved, I believe, 161 um, requests have been granted expedited processing. And like I, in, I said earlier, um, expedited means that you're processed, you're prioritized ahead of non-expedited requests. We've had, we have received not a lot, at least from what I can tell, um, but we received requests where um, they were seeking records that have been requested in other requests. And what we are trying to do, what we're working to do, is to make sure that to the extent that we can close out multiple requests with a response, we'll do that. So, for example, if you requested and just as an example, you requested um, your four requests involved item one, two, and three. And Bruno requested one and two. And Roger requested one. The smartest thing, the more efficient thing for us to do would be process it once. So we'll process the one who requested one, two, and three. And then we'll give all requests one, two, and three. So you get more than you asked for. That way we don't have to process the same document three times. The only disadvantage, if you want to call it that, is you get more than you ask for, which is okay. Now, the primary methods for searches that are conducted are the FOIA office conducts the search independently, or two, we seek the assistance from the COVID-19 Emergency Operations Center. So let me talk about how the FOIA office does searches, because that is probably a matter of interest. So the FOIA office um, I believe sometime, maybe two years ago, uh, secured an e-discovery tool to assist us uh, improve efficiency in responding to FOIA requests. So we have an e-discovery tool that we use um, to independently conduct searches once we've notified the respective programs and people that we're going to conduct 
and the price rights for the documents. Now, in 2019, we only conducted independently. Uh, we used that tool for only 109 requests. So, more than 1,100 requests were were sent to the programs for records. Now, because of COVID-19 and the fact that we have 4,600 people activated or working in some capacity with the pandemic, we no longer send FOIA requests to the programs, to the FOIA coordinators for the programs to ask them to assist us with looking the records. We don't do that anymore because an EOC has been stood up. So CDC activated the emergency operating center. And once that happens, they set up a FOIA liaison to handle requests for documents related to that EOC. So in this case, every COVID-19 related request that is not independently searched for by the FOIA office has to go to the EOC to ask for assistance in locating records. So in some senses, they are disadvantaged because they may not have historical knowledge for the programs. Um, these are folks who are, rotate in and out. Um, people just move, come in and they move out. So they're doing the best they can in assisting us either by giving us leads, um, by giving us names of people who will be best to contact, um, by giving us email boxes that we, they think we should search against, and so on and so forth. Next slide. CDC is proactively releasing quite a bit of COVID-19 related information. And these are two examples of information that's been proactively released by the agency. Um, once you click on the link, it's, they're both are, um, bullets are linkable. It would take you directly to the site. CDC, just like every other agency, uh, under the 2016 amendment to the FOIA statute, are required to post on our website any documents that have been requested three or more times. We do have some requests that what fit into that category. Um, we have not been able to post any documents yet. We will do so um, at some point. Uh, we'll work on, on getting that done, but at this point, we haven't done so. However, in spite of the fact that we haven't been able to do that, what we have done is that we have worked with um, the EOC and the SMEs to help requesters who are seeking data, surveillance data submitted to CDC by the local state um, authorities related to the human infection. It's called the, the case report form, sometimes referred to as a PUI. PUI form. We're having quite a few requests for this information. Of what people are asking for a variety of data related to it, you know, gender, ethnicity, age, that kind of stuff. So what we said was, look, can you guys come up with a public use data set that people could access so that we could take them outside of the FOIA process? So I happened to report that that was established, I think, last week. Uh, we've closed out some requests for that, but that does not mean that if a, a FOIA requester goes and looks at a data set and goes, eh, if that doesn't work for me, that they can't submit a FOIA request. We are hopeful that it would be sufficient, but if you are not, if that doesn't satisfy your, your request, then you're certainly welcome to submit a FOIA request to the agency. Next slide. What can you do to help us get records that you seek? It's a good question. One, keep your request brief. But before I say that, let me say this. A successful FOIA request starts with you. That's who it starts with. You, you get to decide whether your FOIA request is successful or not. We all have a role to play in it but it starts with you. Keep your request brief. Sometimes we get requests that are two, three, four pages long. 
put yourself in the shoes of a, of a analyst who's having to juggle an ADK load or an EOC person who has to look at a FOIA request that we submitted for records and having to decipher what it is that you're asking. By keeping your request brief or at least bottom line up front, it makes it easier. You can add whatever thing you want to add, you know, somewhere else as an appendix. But let's key in, in what do you want so we can get to the point. Give us enough information up front so we can quickly process your request. Sometimes you know exactly what you want. You, you have the context, but your context is buried in some newspaper article that you saw somewhere or some document that we have to decipher by reading the document. So I, I'll give an example. There was a request that I was reviewing, and they had sent out, you know, the request is too broad, it's not it's not clear. We're trying to figure out where to get records. And I kept looking at this stuff, and I said, well, let me keep reading. And I, I started reading the fee waiver um, portion of the request. And it dawned on me that it gave me the context for the request. And that guided me in helping to locate records for that particular request. Now, that's me, okay? That same request with my IT person, who's not an, a FOIA person, he might miss that. He's looking at just where it says, I'm seeking or I'm requesting one, two, and three. That's it. <laughs> so if he's not clear on that, that means he starts going down a path that he shouldn't go because he's going by what he's reading in the request. Ask for what you want and nothing more. Sometimes we get for requests like, let's just throw everything out at them because we fear that if we tell them what we want, we may not get it. I'll say this. Take it for what it's worth, but I really mean it. If you tell us what you want and the document exists, we'll find it. If we can't release it for whatever reason, we'll tell you we can't release it. And if you disagree with the agency, you can file an appeal, you can file a lawsuit. But you can believe that we are not going to purposely say we are not going to give this document, so we're going to play dumb. We're not going to do that. So just ask us for what you want and nothing more. Work with us to do that. Keep your request as narrow and as specific as possible. That helps out a lot with everyone, folks in the FOIA office, with the programs, with the IT person. It keeps it simple. It's really easy when it's very narrow and specific. Um, Try and get your request into the simple track. A request would go into the complex track under certain conditions. One, that we have estimated it's going to take more time and work to respond. So if, if, that, if we make that determination, it's going to go into the complex track. Two, we'll put in the complex track if it will result in us collecting records for multiple programs. So if multiple CIOs are involved in the record collection, it's going to go in the complex track. If the documents collected could be voluminous, that will put you in the complex track. Finally, and they don't, we don't have to check all the boxes. If any one of them could trigger you going in the complex queue. Finally, a complex, you can be placed in a complex track if we have to consult with other programs, other federal agencies, or to make a pre-disclosure notification to submit us or confidential information. We are required under this FOIA statute to notify submitters of confidential business information before their records can be released. And we, are, we have to give them a certain number of days. So I think it's, I think it's initially five days, I could be wrong, but five working days. And then if there's disagreement, or maybe 10. And if there's disagreement on when, if there's disagreement on, if they, if they object to disclosure information and the agency disagrees with the objection, we still have to give them an opportunity to file what they refer to as a reverse FOIA, basically to file a lawsuit to stop us, stop the agents from responding. So if the documents you're requesting, contract documents, 
you should you you should one hundred percent guarantee that you've been a comics queue because we have to factor all those things in in the response time. COVID related responses, there are going to be a lot of consultations because there are multiple agencies involved in it. FEMA, NIH, FDA, HHS. So what you're asking for, if you know, based upon your request, that it covers all these multiple agencies, then don't be surprised if you get placed in a complex queue. And if you don't want to be placed in a complex queue, then try and target it and only seek CDC originated records. Makes it easier. Finally, be realistic about the response time. And it's obvious on the face of the request that what you're asking is not, we're not going to respond to it within 20 web days. We just can't. Even if we wanted to, we just cannot do it. So be realistic about response time. Work with us on your request. If you do, we're more than happy to do everything we can to respond to your request timely. Next slide. So what are tips for narrow score requests? So you might get, if, uh, you might, I'm sure some of you have received some where you get a, a, a request, a letter from us saying your request is overly broad and we need to narrow the scope of your request. Sometimes some of you push back, you push back, we, um, sometimes we, we go ahead and say, okay, let's do it. And sometimes we push back and say, no, we can't do it. You need to narrow the scope of your request. But how can you narrow the scope of the request? Give us names and emails to be searched. For example, if you're looking for emails, um, tell us who the custodians of these records are. Tell us up front. Uh, because the more back and forth that we do with you, the longer it's going to take to respond to your request. That's just the reality. So if you want us to get to Z quickly, then the more information you give us up front, the less time we go, how go back and forth with regard to the scope of your request and how to conduct the search. So tell us that right away and just so we can get moving. Give us a time frame. Um, give us a time frame. The shorter the better. Let's use COVID-19. Every single day, all of us, and I can't imagine how many requests senior leadership are getting or sending every day, a ton of emails. That's pretty much how they conduct their business, a ton. So if you were to seek records for, let's say, um, you're seeking a request for the documents for maybe one of the top three leaders in CDC, let's use Dr. Shaker, for example, and say you want all your emails where the word coronavirus is mentioned, you're pretty much asking for an entire mailbox for that period. That's what you're asking for. So you haven't really identified for us what specific thing about coronavirus do you really want. That's what you need to get to because otherwise you're pretty much asking for, for the most part, an entire mailbox because probably pretty much every single email that she's going to send or receive might contain that word. I'll venture to guess. So a month might be too much under these circumstances. A day or two, three days, a week, much better. Um, target fewer people. Um, most of the time, um, leaders, leaders are copied on emails, and so you don't need to target everyone because you can target one person and you get emails that they sent or received because most of them get copied. And those who are not being copied are not in the loop. So even if you say, I want their documents, it would end up with no hits on them because they went on the loop on that particular subject matter. Provide us with keywords. Combining keywords is very helpful. Again, like I said, sending keywords are unhelpful because they're probably going to appear in every single, for example, if somebody made a for request and was seeking my documents, for example, um, since January for the word coronavirus, you're going to find some, right? Probably nothing that you, is of interest to you, but you're going to find some because pretty much I, I can't imagine any single CDC4 employee who has not received something about coronavirus in a week. 
We all are. So that word is not helpful. By itself, it's not helpful. You have to combine keywords to make it more helpful. Right? Tie the keywords to other words. The closer the proximity, the better. Um, maybe identify a subject matter that you're looking for. It makes it easier because oftentimes, at least I make, make sure as a matter of practice I do this, that my subject line speaks to what it is that the, the content of my email is. So if you are able to identify the subject, then a search can be done against that subject. And even if you don't have the full subject line, for as long as that word appears in the subject, if we do a, 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 a if we, if we independently do a FOIA search, it's going to pull every email that has that word contained in the subject line. And that probably is more likely to respond to your request because they're talking about what it is that you're asking about, as opposed to a keyword, any, any document that contains that word. That could appear in an attachment. It could appear in a newsletter. It could be appearing anything, and it would be totally unrelated to what it is you're asking for. And if we have to go through all those documents in order to respond to you, that's not helpful to you. Limit the volume of the records that you are seeking. And this is, I'm speaking more to journalists and reporters. I see myself a lot. I see stories being written on a few documents, an email here, two emails there, a particular document that was provided. You don't really need a whole lot in order to write a story. And so if that's your goal, if that's what you want to do, then if you help us with your request in terms of fashioning your request, in such a way that we can get you that email that's going to be the, you know, your lead, or that's going to reveal what it is that you want to write a story about, the better for you, the better for us. If you go with this kind of approach about them ask for everything, then you are unlikely to get the documents as soon as you want. Not because we don't want to respond to you timely, it's just because we can't under the circumstances. And finally, I'll say that contact us to assist you with scoping out your request. And I mean this, so you can contact myself, you can contact Bruno, you can contact the special analyst who's assigned your case for Assistant, we'll scope out your scope for your request. Next slide, please. Now, this is now on our FOIA access link, and I, I happened to see this um, as the Congressional Research Service um, did a, wrote up a, a, a very short summary on how different agencies were responding to FOIA requests, and I posted things on our website. So I was surprised to see that. Um, CDC is made it into the research, into the document. Well, obviously, we don't want people to send doc, um, FOIA requests to us by mail, because not all of us are 100% teleworking. There's nobody in the office, no one. <laughs> so uh, we dread in, Bruno was saying we're probably going to get back to a, a room full of FOIA requests. We don't know. We hope not. But So we definitely don't want you to submit FOIA requests by mail. Now, we also started, said that starting May 1st, we didn't want FOIA requests to be submitted to us via email. Then you go, well, why not? Okay. I have very few staff working on FOIA requests. I want to optimize their production. I want them to focus on the real work of responding to FOIA requests. The less time they spend logging requests, the better, right? And so we want FOIA requests, and we want you to input your own request. It's easier. And you can do that through our FOIA public access link. You can do it to the COVID-19. You can do that through FOIA.gov. You are inputting, you're literally inputting your own request. And it's just easier on you. It is easier on us. Uh, and I checked today, um, it's been successful. Uh, we've only received six FOIA requests coming through our mailbox since Saturday. It doesn't mean that if we get a request through our FOIA mailbox, we're not going to log it. We will do it. We are just wanting to discourage people from doing that. That's all. And certainly when we get back to the office, we will resume accepting for requests by mail, um, and that, that would continue. 
Next slide. These are just resources uh, available to you. And at this point, I would open the floor for any questions um, for me or for Bruno. Uh, Roger, thank you so much. Uh, you've done an outstanding job. I think you've covered a lot of material today that I think everyone will find very, very helpful. We have received uh, a few questions on chat. I also want to give our event producer the opportunity to provide uh, information again about how to uh, call with a question. So, Michelle, may I ask you to do that, please? Absolutely, ladies and gentlemen, as we enter Q&A, if you would like to ask a question over the telephone, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your question. Once again, it's pound 2 to ask a question over the phone. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Do we have any questions uh, waiting on the phone line? There are currently no questions on the phone. Okay, great. So, Roger, I'll go ahead and begin uh, by asking you a few questions that we received via chat about uh, searching. Uh, folks had questions about that. Uh, the first question was, um, are, is as follows, are CDC FOIA staff trained by the various CDC components to allow for a better understanding of the CDC's internal responsive documents. If not, would such training foster a stronger collaboration between FOIA staff and stakeholders from various CDC components? Um, the CDC for we do have training um, that we, for our FOIA staff, but we've had it over the years where we bring in subject matter experts from the different programs to tell us about the documents that they collect the sensitivity around the documents. Uh, we have not been able to do that for COVID-19 requests for obvious reasons. Uh, so there's a difficulty with doing that. And, and so said, I would admit that are there challenges with us being able to look at records outside um, on our own now? Yes, because um, it's, it's, it's a moving situation and people rotate in and out. And so we have to primarily rely on going to the EOCs for uh, to assist in locating documents, or we conduct the research independently if uh, we can do so using our discovery tool. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Bruno, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's good. So like Roger was saying, um, you know, we've had speakers or members of CDC staff come in from different areas. So we had someone come and discuss food outbreaks and the different outbreaks that occur at CDC and kind of give us the ins and outs, the types of records that are created. Um, so we do have, you know, we touch base with uh, subject matter experts and they come in and teach us. And um, But we don't just look, rely on that training either, right? So during the processing of requests, if we have a question, we'll go to them. They offer um, their concerns when they provide the documents. So there's different touch points that we use to, you know, better process the documents. Uh, so while, you, while we've been chatting, there have been some other questions about searches, particularly about emails, but I'm just going to uh, ask them in the order in which they came in out of fairness to those folks. Um, someone asked a question to clarify uh, whether the search process documentation is also generated by a computer program. Um, and I think relatedly, uh, if you could clarify why the computer program would be impacted by those who are working for the pandemic. Isn't this just a computer program slash software that conducts searches based on the request? Uh, I want to share on something. So to conduct the, our e-discovery searches, the IT, our IT specialist has to manually put in the keywords, so the combination of the keywords identify the mailboxes um, and other information that the request has provided to conduct the search. That's how the search is conducted. So, um, yeah, so that's how it's not a, a computer, quote, unquote, generated search in that sense. It's somebody has to input information into the search tools and then the system then runs and then it identifies documents based upon the keywords or information that it is such an against. 
And real quick, I want to add to that. So during Roger's presentation as well, he did he mentioned somewhere in there that programs are affected, you know, by the current COVID-19 response. And I, and I want to differentiate between a computer program and the program offices. And so maybe that's a, a CDC term or a government term, but when we say program, in this instance, we need the program office, the office that is the subject matter expert that's doing that work. So there's a difference there between, there is software that we used to do electronic searches, so you could call that a program, but in this instance, it meant the program office, so the folks doing the work. Okay, thanks. I think that does clarify that question. Uh, the next question is, um, how can a requester avoid a, quote, chicken, egg, unquote, situation with identifying the subject of a request? A lot of times, requesters do not know the exact title of a document or record, but know that certain records exist based on other recording, tweets, or a leader's press conferences. Any advice on that? Okay, that's, that's, that's true. So we sometimes, I mean, we don't expect you to know the subject matter. So if you don't know it, then you don't make it up. But give us enough information to help us ask the right question. So I, I, don't, I have routinely gone to my way and said, ask, you know, reach out to people within the program to say, hey, we have a FOIA request for this. What would be a good place for us to go? Because sometimes an e uh, the e-discovery is limiting, right? because, or it might be an inefficient way to look for the document when we can just ask and go in, oh yeah, these people worked on it, they can get it for you. So we certainly reach out, uh, we don't, if you don't know the subject matter, give us enough context, give us the tweet, okay? Give us the statement that the person made, give us when they made it, because that gives us context so we can say, oh, well, we can go and they go, yeah, We've heard about this tweet, we know this happened, but no discussions were had about this. Or this is where you need to go to talk about this, to get records related to this subject matter. So that helps us out with that. Thank you. Uh, Bruno, anything you wanted to add or you're good? Oh yeah, I mean, I would just echo what Roger said. If, you know, you don't need to know the specific title of a document. But if you can pinpoint, you know, a few days around the time it came out, or like Roger said, when a tweet came out, or, you know, the, you know, the guidance on wearing masks, or something like that, you can pinpoint when a document was released or information was released. If you can just get us in the area, we'll be – all you need to do is describe the document you're looking for. You don't need to give us pinpoint accuracy on the exact title of the document. Okay, great. So another um, email-related uh, question, uh, how are requesters supposed to provide email addresses for search? Most emails are redacted under B6, Exemption 6, under the FOIA, and it's hard for requesters to guess the email addresses. Okay, um, so let me, let me be more precise in my response. So when we say email addresses, email addresses of external employees, right? So we don't, you don't need to give us an email address for a CDC employee. We, we, we've got that down pat. You don't have to worry about that. But for example, if you say, um, if, if, you, if you are asking for an external person and you just give us a name, you know who that person is. We might not know who that person is, right? And so it is easier for us to do a search using an, a, an email domain name. So even if you don't know the, the email address of the person, but you know the domain name for where the person works, that's good enough. We can use that as our basis. So that's what we mean by, to the extent that you can give us, the more information you can give us to conduct, conduct the search, the better. If you don't know, again, context matters, right? That would be helpful to us. And uh, folks can also avail themselves of the organizational charts, right, that are posted on the Absolutely. CDC website that are Absolutely. also displayed in the PowerPoint today so they can get a better understanding of where folks fit in to the organization. Okay, another um, email related uh, question. Can you talk about what search capabilities you have with email searches? For example, terms and connectors like and, were, not, wild cards for keywords. Bruno, you yeah, want to take that? Yeah, I'll take that one. So we can, as far as email search capability, we can use all of those. And I've just learned as well, we can do um, near. So like if you wanted coronavirus and another term, you can give us how many words within coronavirus you want the other term. 
So that might be another way to uh, link a document, but still, you know, because we run into instances with, let's say, coronavirus and mask, okay? So like, just as an example, coronavirus and mask may be in that document, but coronavirus is up at tippy top, whereas the mask is somewhere on page 93 where they're talking about a mask or, you know, it's a different document altogether, but the word mask is there. So by linking or using the near feature, we can do within so many words, within 10 words, within words where coronavirus and mask would likely be in the same discussion. So instead of just, you know, on totally opposite ends of the document, we can do um, and is a good one because it links the two. We can do or not. I mean, so I guess any of those Boolean search terms that, uh, use, I think we have access to most of them. Okay, thanks, that's really helpful. Uh, another question, is CDC <laughs> conducting independent searches on COVID-19 requests at all, or is the FOIA office asking the COVID-19 Emergency Operations Center to conduct all searches? Uh, we do, we're doing both. So this, this, we're doing both. So this year, I think I looked at the data window, we have conducted, as of yesterday, 244 independent searches for COVID-related requests. So I'll probably go and say about slightly more than 50% of COVID-related requests have been done by the FOIA office. So the difference is being sent to EOCs. So it's, it's, it's a split. We're not, it's not exclusively going to EOCs and it's not exclusively being done by the FOIA office. Okay. Sometimes, Sometimes you might have a, a request where it's a hybrid, where parts of it can be done by us and parts of it we need to go to the EOC. Okay. And I would say, so, you know, given current circumstances, we're trying as many as we can do, we're trying to help out in any way that we can. So if we can pull a search and not, you know, have to pull someone off or, you know, even try to ask to pull someone off to do a search, we're doing everything we can in order to assist CDC staff to where we can take care of the FOIA part and they can go take care of their normal everyday duties. Sure, that makes sense, thanks. I'm just gonna pause for a second. We have a number of other chat questions just to check in with our event producer if there are any calls waiting on the line. There are currently no calls um, in queue. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, pound two will enter you into the verbal question queue. All right, great, thanks. So continuing with our chat questions. Uh, could you talk about any efforts CDC is working on regarding proactive release of records? Um, there's no doubt a lot of FOIA requests uh, that are seeking COVID-19 related records. Is your office working to proactively release that data? I think you guys already covered this during the presentation, but... Um, Bruno, you want to take uh, that and I'll speak about it for you. Yeah, so I mean, CDC is proactively releasing some information. Like Roger said, just last week we had some uh, new tool that could be used to pull data. Um, the CDC FOIA office, um, as we respond to FOIA requests, we do plan to post information on the CDC FOIA website. We just haven't gotten to that point yet. But, um, you know, I know if you look there now, there's not a whole lot to see, but we will be, we'll be improving in that aspect and posting records um, in the future. And I just want to second that, and that we, we take ownership of the fact that we have not um, been able to do that. Uh, well, I'm not going to make any excuses for that, but we will definitely work on making sure that uh, requests that meet that the three or more requirements are posted to the website. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, can you explain how the CDC gets and gathers state-level data on the number of people tested uh, numbers of those numbers of people tested, morbidity, cause of death, where death occurred in a nursing home, homeless shelter, or hospital. I don't know whether you're able to answer substantive questions. <laughs> Someone did ask that question. <laughs> um, I, I, let me, I'll give it a shot. And, and this is, um, let me take my FOIA hat off, please. So I'm not giving an agency response. I'm giving a, a Roger response. Um, if you read some of our uh, what do you call the MMWR reports? Um, they show how the agency has been collecting data um, from local and state and counties, and it they, it goes through. If you read them, they it, they also show that um, 
sometimes the information that's provided is spotty, right? They, they don't provide information for all the columns, right? So CDC just takes what they can get. I also recall, I think, recently, the vice president ordered or directed, maybe use that word, directed, um, that um, certain types of information, especially about nursing homes and uh, hospitals and beds and equipment needed to be submitted to report it to CDC. So um, that's how, so to the extent, to what extent, what information they are collecting on a daily basis, I don't know the details, but I know that we are collecting information. We are receiving information. And I, let me say this, I was kind of surprised when they said, you know, some of this information can be sent by email. So think about it. If they're sending, if, if CDC is receiving by email data from the states or from the, somebody has to take that data and put it into something else, right? So if you make a FOIA request and say, I'm looking for this data, don't be surprised we can't get it to you soon, right? Because they're still working on trying to take that information, submit it to an email or on a form, right, because that, it's not, and then putting it into some spreadsheet or some data that they can analyze. So that takes time. So if they say we can't respond, there's nothing really the four of us can do at that point, but just to wait. And so our push in that, our push would be, hey, can you come up with a public use data set? That way we can push these people out of the FOIA process. Um, so one of my colleagues is directing uh, folks to cdc.gov forward slash mmwr uh, forward slash index dot html. That's the link for the information that this person was asking about. Uh, Michelle, our event producer is informing me that we have a call on the line. A caller, can you please go ahead? Caller, your line is unmuted. You may ask your question. Hi, my name is uh, Greg Bridges. I'm, I work at FEMA's FOIA office. Um, I was just wondering, um, what are you all doing to prioritize your responses to the COVID request against non-COVID-related FOIA requests, um, particularly non-COVID-related requests that also qualify for expedited processing? Um, thank you for the question. I, I would say, the overwhelming number of FOIA requests that CDC is responding to right now are COVID-related. Fortunately, and I didn't give this data, but I'll, I'll go and say it now. So even though, as of yesterday, we received 1,706 incoming requests, we have responded to 1,091, okay? So probably most of the non-COVID-related responses We've responded to most of them, and so right now what we are really dealing with for the most part are COVID-19 related responses, and our non-COVID related responses are generally, I don't believe that we have any one of those requests where they have requested expedited processing. That doesn't mean that we are not prioritizing them, right? We want to respond to all requests. But if a request has been given expedited processing, then obviously that comes ahead of a non-expedited request. But at the end of the day, it, it's, it's driven by whether there are records to process, right? So if, you're, if we've granted you expedited processing but there are no records to process, and we have a non-COVID-related uh, request with records, it's going to be processed to go out. <laughs> so we are trying to work and respond to all our requests as soon as we can. That's, 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 that's our bottom line. I mean, we, we pride ourselves on being one of the best FOIA programs, at least within HSS, for sure, we can say that. Um, and we don't want to slip back to where we used to be, where CDC's FOIA program was always in the news for delayed in FOIA responses, um, telling requesters it would take three or four years to respond to a request. We don't want to go back there at all. And we want to, that's why one of the reasons why we had this meeting is because we want to be proactive and work with requesters and paint the picture for you to understand that we're doing the best we can, but a successful FOIA request starts with you. You can help us with the way you craft your request. You can help us with the way, with your willingness to be open to modifying the scope of your request. 
so that we can respond to your request as soon as we can because we both have the same goal. You want records, we want to close that request down. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much for that uh, question. Uh, another chat question related to searches. Uh, you said that when you pass a request along to the appropriate record keeper, that record keeper is given a deadline. What is the consequence for missing these deadlines and how much do missed deadlines contribute to extending your turnaround times? Uh, let me start with the consequences. The CDC office, we don't, we can't impose any penalties on them for not providing documents. We can't do that. And I don't know whether um, they get in trouble with their leadership. But this is what we do for our contributor purposes. Like we said, we have an overdue list that we send out to the program's leadership every month. So there's visibility. That drives competition, right? Because nobody, everybody, they want their programs to look good. Um, and and I, I know for a fact, right? Um, when I first started in CDC, the overdue list was running about 400 to 500 requests a month, right? At some point in 2008, we had zero. That's how committed people are. I mean, they take it seriously. They don't want to be on that list. The fact that they're on that list is not because they, they don't care or not working on it. It's because their factors beyond their control. So. We are selling today, I'm not going to today blame their programs for delaying responses. That's beyond their control because they're really working hard to give us responses. 83% 83, 83 of CDC's FOIA responses were responded to timely. I can say that. And that's how that data shows. 83% of the FOIA requests that we have responded to, we responded to them timely. So we are continuing to work with the programs to get us records as soon as we can, we, we push them. And that's what we've offered to them and say, hey, look, if you can give us a lead, a person, an email box to search again, whatever it is that you can do to help us look at a document, we'll do that so you don't have to worry about it. And I, I can uh, add to that a little bit. So like Roger was saying, um, when he got here, the, the overdue report had about 480, I think, requests on it. And the, the attitude of the program was kind of, understandably, I would argue, you know, the CDC FOIA office is behind. Why should I, you know, kill myself to get you these documents if they're just going to sit in a, in a closet somewhere? So we work very hard to, you know, improve our processes and things. And I can tell you that the program um, people responsible for giving us these responses take it very seriously. So Roger sends out a monthly report that I've prepared for him. And I'm the lucky guy. He says, if you have any questions, please contact Bruno. So I'm the lucky guy that gets those emails. But people are, they take it very seriously. Their management takes it seriously, and you can tell, because I get every month, I, as soon as that report goes out, oh, my gosh, you know, let me clean this up, let me clean that up. You know, we sent this, we, you know, they, I get contacted a lot when that report goes out, either by the manager themselves or the people in charge of pulling those records. So, um, and like Roger said, we were at 480 or so when he got here, and I think it was September or October of last year. I think it was last year where we had zero overdue for the entire agency, at least responsive records coming from the program office to the FOIA office, there was zero for that month. So um, it is taken seriously. You know, we obviously take it seriously because we need those records to do our job and they take it seriously because they don't want their managers coming in behind them and saying, hey, why isn't this being responded to, so. Sure. All right, well, that sounds great, thank you. A um, Couple more search questions. Uh, we have one that asks, what keywords do you recommend using when trying to identify communications, planning, resources sent from the CDC to states? Bruno? You can think about that one. We can answer yeah. it first if you can't answer right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, and again, I think this is a, a, a good, maybe this isn't a perfect response, but this kind of gives you a, a, a view into what we're working with. So. I don't have a perfect response to give you um, as far as what the keyword should be, but we can run a search and we can always, if you, you know, if we respond to requests and we say we didn't find anything or, you know, we found very little and we turn it over to you, that, that doesn't have to be the end of the process there. So you can adjust from that point, submit a new request. You can call us and say, hey, I'm trying to get this document, but the response that you sent me wasn't exactly what I was looking for. Um, so we can work together to try to find that document. We can reach out to the program. 
get some insight. Maybe they have a better idea than we would because they're the ones that are doing the sending to the states or receiving stuff from the states, however that relationship is happening. Um, we can reach out to them because they would have more insight than the FOIA office would, and then we can work with the requester in order to try and um, pinpoint the exact document that you're looking for. I, I've thought about something now that Bruno has, has gone, which would be a different route rather than using a keyword. So, for example, um, if you can identify the state department or local state agency that CDC interacted with, right? So, for example, any email correspondence between CDC employees and the state, then that would include, presumably, this document that you're referring to. So if you don't know the keyword, but at least you know the players, you know the people that CDC would have contacted in the state, then that's your in route into getting the document because we can easily, you know, lo uh, locate <clears throat> the documents through our e-discovery about email conversations between CDC personnel and California or Georgia or whatever state it is. Because there's only a few people, <laughs> right? Right. Okay. Uh, one more uh, question we have on searches. Does the CDC FOIA office conduct cross-reference searches from the beginning, or is that something that needs to be specified in the request or on appeal, on administrative appeal? Could, could, the person, could you, the person, clarify what you mean by cross-reference searches? So uh, I can just give you a sure. clarification from my own personal experience, having worked at the FBI for almost 15 years. So um, some, there's some information that is only mentioned in a particular file. Uh, it's not the main subject of a file. And so uh, some requesters uh, are interested in that information as well. Um, but perhaps you're the way you're, you're conducting your search is, uh, uh, is not conducive to that. Uh, but maybe you could talk about that for a minute in terms of subject matter versus something that's just a mere mention, a passing reference to a subject matter. Well, if, if without such capabilities, if you just give us a word and you give us the names of the people, or the custodians of those records, if that word happens to appear in any document that they, that they received or sent or called out by any, or anything, it would come up. <laughs> so the, okay. the computer would look for it for us because it's going to identify that word in whatever document and wherever it's located. Okay. Based upon the search parameters. Thank you. So uh, moving on, we actually have one exemption-related question, um, and I will leave it to your discretion if you think it's broad enough to answer. Uh, with regard to contract and procurement information, does the CDC apply Exemption 3 to contract or bid and proposal information after the contract has been awarded by the agency? Or does the, use, does the CDC use Exemption 4 to withhold this information in addition to Exemption 3? I, I can only speak from my experience at CDC and for experience with the records that I'm familiar with. We primarily withhold contract documents using Exemption 4. Have we maybe used Exemption 3 in some circumstances? Possibly. But primarily, we use Exemption 4. Right, yeah. There, we do, I mean, there's some information in contracts um, like Roger said, it's going to be withheld under Exemption 4. There's going to be some that is withheld under Exemption 3, um, proposal-related information in some instances. So it just depends on, you know, the, the contract itself, you know, what point in the contract, if it was awarded or not awarded. There's a lot of factors that go into that um, question. So I can't give you a hard and fast, like, paint by numbers, yes or no, whatever, but um, there are instances, yes, that 3 and 4 will be used in both. Uh, so we did receive one question just shortly before we started our webinar today. I'm not sure if you're able to answer it, but uh, I'm just going to pose it. How would FOIA or HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, apply to information contained in death certificates or in state agencies' vital statistics database? I, 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 would, I would pass on that question. I can't speak to HIPAA. So I'll have to pass on that question. That's fair. 
All right. Um, I'm going to ask Michelle uh, if we have any other questions on the line, because I believe we've exhausted our chat questions. There are currently no questions on the line. All right, um, I'm just going to double check that we've asked you all the questions. It looks like we have. Um, okay. And uh, I think we can give folks back the gift of time, give them a few minutes off early uh, to, to go and, um, and have lunch. Uh, we, again, want to thank uh, Roger and Bruno for their time today. Uh, lots of great information. Uh, we're all living under these unprecedented circumstances. The CDC in particular is uh, and uniquely situated to really experience um, what's going on. Uh, and we very much hope that everyone has found this information helpful, uh, helpful and insightful. I do want to remind everyone we've posted the PowerPoint presentation. We did just get a question on the line, Alina, sorry. Okay, that Roger posted, uh, that Roger presented today, the uh, PowerPoint presentation is online on the OGIS website. Um, so I want to invite everyone to take a look at that. And our event producer informs us that we have one call on the line. So um, go ahead, please. That question is for, that question is for Bruno. <laughs> All right. So, Kula, your line is now unmuted. Excellent. Thank you. I'm sorry to squeeze in there. Uh, my name is Zach Newman with, uh, with Nine News based in Denver. And um, I know one thing I'm trying to wrap my head around is the responses for the, from the various agencies, you know, between FEMA and HHS and then uh, CDC within HHS. And so I'm curious about um, your recommendation for making sure that all bases are covered within the, the FOIA process. And I'm, you know, since specifically we'll be filing FOIAs within Colorado, but was just curious if there's, um, particular difference in like document names or, or just in general as I'm requesting that I should be aware of between all those agencies. Um, so I mean what I would say is as far as if you if you need documents from HHS, CDC and FEMA, um, as far as the HHS and CDC portions would go I think it'd be cleaner if you sent that request to HHS. They will then um, refer down our portions for us to respond to. But like Roger was saying at the beginning during his presentation, clearly there's going to be a lot of consultation that's going to be required on on, the, on that FOIA. Um, each agency only makes a determination on their own on their own records. So, you know, if HHS or if FEMA equities are contained within the CDC portions. Um, we would either consult or refer that to them for them to respond either directly to you or to give us their response and that, so that we could respond for our portions or within our portions. So, um, but as far as names of documents and terms and that, as far as that goes, I, you know, I don't, it would depend on what you're asking for, but I wouldn't have any insider knowledge as to how HHS or FEMA um, structures their documents or the documents they collect or anything like that. I, I would say this, uh, just a suggestion. Um, take a look at NIH's website, take a look at FDA's website, take a look at FEMA's website, um, take a look at some of the statements that are being made by officials working at these agencies. That will give you an insight as to who's doing what, for example, right? So if the CDC director went and said something somewhere about something on that semester, then you know if you're looking for stuff around about that subject matter, you're going to come to CDC. Um, if, if it's communications, let's say, between FEMA, DHS, about, let's say, uh, PPEs or whatever it is, and uh, consultations with CDC, then you should automatically know, right, that CDC is going to have to go to, to uh, FEMA and consult with them or vice versa. So if, if, if you're willing to wait for that process to go forward, then by all means make that for your request. But if you want something quickly, then you might want to focus on targeting request that would not require consultation or not a lot of consultation. I mean, if the field, I mean, we've received consultations from FEMA, for example, um, at least FEMA, uh, and we try and, and respond to them very quickly. I mean, we take a day or two, go through it, because we know, look, they're under the gun like everybody else, and we, we're not going to hold it. So, but that's CDC. I can't speak to what other agencies are doing, but when we get a consultation from another federal agency, we try as much as possible to 
look at CDC's equities, give them our disclosure determinations, and just keep it moving. Thank you very much. Um, any other callers on the line uh, before we close up? I do not see any additional questions. Okay. All right. Well, again, uh, Roger, thank you very much. Bruno, thank you very much. Um, and I hope everyone and their families remain safe, healthy, and resilient. Uh, take care, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.